runt. You all ready to get in the Word of God this morning? All right, if you would stand with me for the honor of reading God's Word, we're going to be in Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, we'll read verses 11 through 20. Acts 19. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. And there diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts uh, brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your word. It is true. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds today. Lord, that you would uh, remove the darkness, Father, and, and, and help us to see your truth and step into the light of your kingdom. How many preach plain and clear today, Lord? I do understand the judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word of truth, and I accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, and his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So as we've been going through the book of Acts, we've been seeing the power of God at work. Why? To spread the gospel. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So all through the book of Acts, we see that the purpose of Acts is to show us how the church grew, how the gospel spread, and how the witness of the kingdom of God was told throughout the world. And throughout the book of Acts, we have various encounters, some supernatural and some of them are very supernatural and miraculous, but all, all for, for one reason, to advance the gospel, to increase the witness. So as we read through this first few verses, at the end of it, the result was, and the word of God prevailed mightily. When we think of the supernatural, when we think of miraculous, and we think of uh, uh, the ex- extraordinary or the extraordinary. Uh, we have to realize those are, those are not normal happenings. Those are rare happenings. The, they're not common. They don't happen just all the time. And, and so in the book of Acts, we have this record of, of Paul being in Ephesus and, and he's got these handkerchiefs that, that people are believing has some power in it. Now, the city of Ephesus was a huge city. It had a massive population. It was one of the leading cities of pagan worship of the goddess uh, um, Artemis. And, uh, and it was filled with people who would spoke many different languages. And they were very superstitious. They were very involved in the dark magic. And they were very involved in witchcraft and idolatry. And so what God's going to do, he's going to show us some truth through the story. He's going to show us that Jesus is greater than the darkness. That God calls people out of the darkness and into the light. And that darkness must flee when Jesus is present. And so we have this instance of Paul. And God's going to use their frame of reference and their understanding... And he's going to use it, and he's going to display himself showing that he has more power and authority over the dark magic that they're involved in. And so he's a tent maker. Paul, uh, many times, was bivocational in his ministry. 
There are many times in Paul's ministry that he was full-time, where churches supported him, and, and he didn't have to work and preach. But here at Ephesus, he was doing a bivocational ministry. He was working part-time, preaching part-time, working part-time, preaching part-time. And he was a tent maker or uh, a leather worker. And as he's working out in the hot sun, he's got what we would call sweatbands. He has cloths. Around his forehead, he's got an apron around, and as he's working and he's sweating, uh, people are taking his cloths and they're 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 laying them on those who are sick, and and people are being healed. And this is extraordinary, and this is a, this is amazing. Now, now let's think about this, and let's think about the whole of Scripture, and we as Christians, we've got to be discerning, and we've got to use our mind a little bit. Okay. So let's just take, for instance, God speaking. The audible voice of God speaking to an individual. That rarely happens in Scripture. Very rare. God the Father, audible voice speaking from heaven. Okay? Those are rare occurrences. So if somebody goes around and says, yeah, I hear the voice of God speaking to me from heaven all the time, I kind of wonder, you know. Now, I'm not talking about the inward voice of the Holy Spirit who leads us. I'm talking about an audible voice from heaven, okay? Also, healings and miracles and and all that, those didn't just happen all the time. They were for purposes. The purpose is one for Jesus. Jesus established his messiahship, that he was a prophet. Peter, that he was an apostle. Paul, that he was an apostle, all for leading people to the truth of the gospel so that people would come out of darkness and into light. Because I get greatly disturbed, I mean greatly disturbed, when I'm watching televangelists or so quote-unquote faith healers on TV trying to get people to pay them money for a prayer cloth. If you'll just send your best gift, and they'll, 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 they'll make up some type of, they'll have a verse to go with it, say like Psalm 119, of $119. And you'll send that seed in. I'm going to send you this prayer cloth, and it's going to have the power of God on it, and you're going to put it on you, and you're going to be healed. It, this, we have to be smarter than that. We have to be more discerning than that. There's charlatans out there. I mean, could you imagine the Apostle Paul trying to use healing as a way to make money? Well, if he, if he would have knew that, that he could have done that, he could have just started sw- uh, selling his sweatbands and not even working. Could you imagine Peter making a mockery and a show out of healing? We've got to discern, folks. And for those of you who just, you just got to have somebody that you want to give your money to because you think that their prayer cloth is going to somehow, some way help you, <laughs> then uh, I'll pray. <laughs> we got we to gotta think. Now, this is something extraordinary that God is doing, and he's doing this for a specific purpose, a specific time, and for a witness that's going to happen in Ephesus, and it's going to change this city. And so word gets out about all this miraculous healing and the power that goes on, and so these, these Jewish uh, uh, priests who are trying to exercise a demon, they think, man, Paul's got, he's got some secret formula that we don't know about. Because what would happen in the city of Ephesus, there was a lot of enchanters, there was a lot of magicians, and, and they felt like the more, uh, the more words you could throw into the chant, or even the more diverse words you could use, so if you could throw a little Hebrew in there, or an Aramaic, or Greek word, and you kind of put them all together and, and make it sound like this really cool chant, then it you would get more money. You could get more money that way, and it would be more powerful. And so they hear this new name, this Jesus, whom Paul is preaching, and they start 
uh, trying to cast out this demon from this person and in the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And then the guy that's demon-possessed uh, looks at him and says, I know Jesus, and I'm familiar with Paul, but who are you? The demons knew Jesus. There's two different Greek words there that's in, in play. He, to know Jesus and being familiar with Paul. They knew, they, they personally knew Jesus. Why did, how the demons know Jesus? Because demons are fallen angels and they, were, they, were, they knew the eternal Christ. They knew Jesus. In fact, when you read the Gospels, who recognized Jesus before anyone else? The demons. They knew Jesus. Oh, they knew who he was. They knew who they were fighting against. And they were familiar with Paul. Paul had made such an impact in the kingdom that the demons even knew his name. That, that, that does raise a good question for us, doesn't it? Do we live our lives in such faithfulness and godliness and holiness and we're making an impact on the kingdom of God in such a way that the demons know our name? They knew Paul. They were familiar with Paul but they had no idea who this guy was. And so he turns on them, beats them up, strips them, and they run out the house naked. Well, just like today, even though they didn't have Twitter or Facebook, word spread, right? I mean, you, you're not going to keep something like that quiet. And so verse 17, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and what happened? Fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. The name of Jesus was magnified. The name of Jesus was taught. The name of Jesus was preached. The name of Jesus was received. Verse 18. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them inside of all, and they counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. When they encountered the risen Lord, and when they encountered the truth of who Jesus was, it changed their life. When they were brought out of darkness and into light, they were a changed people. What did they do? What did these Christians at Ephesus do? They repented of their sin. How do we know that? Because they started divulging all of their secrets. They started telling all of their tricks. In the magic world, it was that if once you told the secret of that enchantment, it was then powerless. So what they were doing is they were giving all the information. They were telling all the tricks of the trade. They were exposing all of the false and the tricks and the, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the evil behind it. Why? Because they no longer wanted that to have master over them. And they were... They were getting rid of it. They were coming clean. They were repenting. You see, I'm afraid that in, in our culture, in our church culture, we've made repent a noun instead of a verb. Because the Bible never commands us just to say that we repent. The Bible says repent so I'm not saved by just saying, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I can say that I repent of my sin and not repent of my sin. True? I can say I follow Jesus and not follow Jesus. Just because I say it doesn't mean I have received it and believed it and I'm walking in it. But these folks... They had a true conversion. How do we know? Because they actually took all of their stuff that they once held on to. They took all of their magic, all their books, all the stuff, and they had a holy bonfire. 
And they said, we need to get this out of our house. It no longer belongs here. I'm a child of God now. I no longer have a reason to hold on to these dark magics and this false stuff of worship. And they began cleaning their closets. They cleaned their closet. They took it off their bookshelf, off their coffee table, and they just brought it out. And they just lit it up. And they just burned it up. 50,000 pieces of silver. It's estimated. We don't know exactly the, the cost but anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000 was burned that day. And I can just hear a, a good American Christian right now saying, hmm, we could have sold those, you know. We could have sold that and given it to the church. But they didn't want anyone to have it. It was taking them towards death. Why would they want to sell it and give it to anybody else? Why do you want to take something that's demonic and give it to somebody else? No, when it, if it's bad, it's bad. Get it out. You have to get it out. Remove it. I wonder what it would look like today if the church allowed the Holy Spirit to shine the light of the dark places in our soul, of things that have a bondage on us, things that we're trapped by, and that we would just have a holy bonfire and come clean. I wonder what that would look like. I would imagine we'd probably have a lot of iPhones on the altar We'd have a lot of computers on the altar. We'd have a lot of things in your shelves on the altar. We'd have a lot of we'd have a we'd have a lot of drug paraphernalia on the altar. And we say, "This is killing me. This is destroying me. It's got to get up on out of my house. It has no place here. I no longer need it. I no longer want it. I'm changed. I'm different. It needs to go." and burn it. They started divulging all the secrets. Here's where it's made. Here's how they're making it. Here's who's selling it. That kind of behavior will shake up a city. That type of behavior will shake up a community. That type of behavior behavior would change things and the word of God prevailed mightily well Christianity was making an impact why because there were those who were walking in darkness now walking in light and they no longer live the way they used to and when you no longer live the way you used to you no longer go to the places you used to go you no longer purchase the things you used to purchase And this is going to make a, another guy mad. His name is Demetrius. And the next few verses we, we read, this is the first time we read of Paul's plan to go to Rome. That's found in 21 and 22. Let's go to verse 23. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. That means there's a big commotion going on about the way. The way, we know the way is Jesus. The way in Acts was referred to the church. That's what they called Christians, the way. They, they, they saw them as a sect of Judaism. They called them the way. And, um, and so uh, there's no small disturbance about the way. That means there's a lot of commotion, a lot of talk uh, about this, these people called Christians. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. That's, again, that's Luke's way of saying he, he brought a lot of money to the craftsmen. It's because of him a lot of people had jobs. It's because of him a lot of people made, made money. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that God's made with hands are not gods. And there is a danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. What happened? 
When they stepped out of darkness and into light, they realized they no longer need their magic books and their magic spells. They got rid of the darkness. They also realized that there is only one God. There is one Lord and maker of all, heaven and earth. His name is Jesus. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And beside him, there is no other. Therefore, all of those little false gods that they're making uh, in, in town aren't gods. Because Ephesus was the place to be. The temple to Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was extravagant. It was huge. It was, it was a place where people came to. It was in May, and they're having a huge celebration. This is one of their festivities. It's a, it's a massive time of people traveling to the city. And as they're traveling to the city, they want to worship at the temple. Temple prostitutes, temple, all, this, all of the paganism that's going on. And they have people like Demetrius who are silversmiths who are making all these little mini temples out of silver. And they're making little mini idols of Artemis, the, the goddess. And people are buying them. And they're selling them. And they're, they're making a lot of profit because they have a lot of people coming through to worship on the celebration. There's gaming going on. There's festivities going on. There's a lot of food and drink and sport and fun. And it's just a, it's just a huge money opportunity for those in Ephesus. And when the Christians decided those little things those guys are making... They're not really gods. Guess what they stopped doing? They stopped buying them. And when enough Christians stopped buying them, what did they realize? They're going to lose some profit. And there's nothing that won't make somebody upset more than hitting them in their wallet. Right? You start hitting them in the wallet, then the real God shows up. It, it reveals who their God really is. But they can't just say that it's about their profit because you always got to make your stance seem a little noble, right? And so it's like, we're losing all this profit, guys. And oh, by the way, our goddess is being diminished. If you ever want to try to incite a riot and have a cause, what do you always got to do to try to make it sound a little better? Dab a little religion on there and try to make it sound and try to justify what you're doing. And so here they have, they have an economic crisis, then they, they make it about a religious crisis, and they start inciting a riot. I mean, they're, 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 they're getting everybody. So Demetrius is probably like a, he, a guy in charge of all of the uh, traitors, and he's saying, hey, we got to do something about it. And they start causing a riot. Look at verse 28. Now, when they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion. And they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent, him, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. This is, a, this is exactly like a riot. This is just a mob. This is mob mentality. If you've ever taken anything like, like a psychology or social psychology, this is a typical mob violent behavior. And what happens? How do you incite a mob? How do you get, how do you incite a riot? Well, number one, you have to have a cause that you're willing to fight over. And so they're losing money. They're willing to fight over that. You get some guy that's a good speaker, has a little bit of charisma about it. You got Demetrius. He rallies him up. Guys, we're losing money because all these Christians are not believing in our God because this guy named Paul is telling them that they're really not gods at all. How many of y'all going to take that? No, not us, you know. And they say, yeah, you know, we, we got to run this guy out of town. Yeah, it's all these Christians. Yeah, and besides, they're making mockery of our goddess. 
yeah, and then they just start screaming, yelling, and everybody gets in confusion, and then there's some people on the, on the bystanders, right, you know, they're sitting there at their tent, and they're trying to sell their stuff, they're hearing what the commotion's going on, go, well, I wonder what's going on, they go over there, and they just hear somebody, yeah, you know, they're great as Artemis, you're like, yeah, great as Artemis, and they start yelling and screaming, and, and before you know it, you just got this whole group of people screaming and yelling, and somebody look over, like, what, you know, what's all this about, I, I don't really know, but great as Artemis, you know, yeah, I mean, we're, I'm in this, you know, and I don't know really what, what they were able to do. You know, could you think of riding back then? Uh, I mean, there was no couches to, to light up. There was no cars to tip over. There was no spray cans of graffiti, graffiti to go on. All they did, they just sat there and screamed for two hours, great as Artemis, great as Artemis. Typical mob mentality. Why are they so upset? Well, ultimately, we know that Satan is behind this. He doesn't want the gospel to spread. But he will use, he'll use money, economy, religion to try to hinder the things of God. When you start messing with people's wealth, it will incite a riot, right? So, let's just take, for example, we have an event in our state in May known as Derby, Kentucky Derby. And in Louisville, they had this huge coliseum. Now, this coliseum they were riding in here um, it's not like just like a movie theater. It's about 25, it hosts 25,000 people. So 25,000 people are gathered, you know, our whole county. <laughs> you know, 25,000 people, ah! And let's just say, I know our, our, our state only wants to say that casino gambling is gambling, but let's just say that um, betting on the horse tracks is gambling as well. Let's just say. Just say. And what would happen if on the big Kentucky Derby Day, all of the pagans and everybody that, that would go there and just worship and celebrate and, 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 and spend all their money and bet all their money and the infield is nuts, crazy, that people are saved, set free, and no one shows up this year. You think some people are going to be a little upset? Especially if they could tie it to a belief system? You better believe it. Why? Because when you mess with people's money, you mess with their God. What has a stronghold? on you what is it that's taking first place you see because God doesn't play second he deserves first and he deserves best we have some people who will spend more money on their kids travel sports teams than they will the kingdom of God. And if that offends you, then that's your God. Because where you spend your time and where you spend your talents and how you use your talents and how you spend your treasure reveals your priorities. It does. And they messed with their God. And they stirred it, and they made a change. Now, notice what they didn't do. They didn't have to pick it. They didn't have to protest the temple. All they did was preach the gospel. And when they preached the gospel, people got saved, genuinely saved, changed, converted, and they walked in a different way. What would happen if we as Christians allowed the gospel to truly change us, and it change 
where we go, what we do, and how we spend our money. Do you think that the Hollywood would take notice if they spent $54 million on a film that's filled with nudity and violence and and vulgarity and and speaking against the name of our God? If Christians just said, you know what, I don't need to see that movie. Stop going. And they started going in the hole. Do you think that wouldn't that wouldn't mean something? That that wouldn't state something? Oh, preacher, you're sounding a little old fashioned. You're saying we can't go to movies? No, I'm not saying we can't go to movies. I'm saying you better watch how you spend the the money that you have because where you direct that money, it shows who your God is. What you value, what you care about, what you think. And Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. You will love one and hate the other. You can't serve God and mammon. That's money. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be what? Added unto you. What were the early Christians doing here in Ephesus? They were walking in the light of Jesus said, let your light shine before men so that they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As a Christian, there's some places you just don't go to anymore. There's some things you just don't do anymore. There's some things you don't buy anymore. There's some new things that you start doing. You take the old off and you put on the new. And you walk in the new man because you've been saved and delivered. I don't know what your stronghold is. I don't know what it is that might be competing for first place. I don't know, I don't know what your little gods are. I don't know what your little silver idols are. I know the Christians in Ephesus said, no more. No more. That's not a part of my life anymore. They took all their books. They said, no more. That's death. What is it that you need to say no more to? What is it that you need to step out of? What is it that you're still flirting with? Is it an attitude? Is is it resentment? Despair? Unforgiveness? What is, what's got a stronghold on you? Is it anger? Is it lust? Is it pride? Selfishness? Is it an addiction? I don't know, what is it? I think we need to have a, a, a holy bonfire at the altar today. What do you think? I think we need to come clean this morning to be honest with God. We need to do and pray as David said, search me, O God, and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to shine the spotlight on your heart and say, Lord, if there's anything that I'm holding on to that is sinful, that you would expose it so that I can step out of the darkness and into your light would you allow the Holy Spirit to to do his work whether it be breaking free from a a faulty way of thinking or believing whether it be getting set free from religion maybe some of you have never placed your faith in Jesus and you don't have a relationship with the Lord and you say man I need to be saved today I've I've never began a walk with the Lord I don't even I don't know him maybe that's you today you need to say hey I I need I need to know Jesus so whatever is going on would we allow the spirit of God to search us to speak to us to convict us to show us so that we might step out of darkness and into the light so Paul says walk as children of the light
Let's pray. Father.